chairman of the Tea Party Caucus Advisory Committee to the Tea Party Caucus of the Legislature. And I'm so happy to be able to introduce you to some of the uh, most courageous people I know on the front lines of something that's important to all of us, and that is education in the state of Texas. Um, you're here because you care about education, and really and truly, we should have this room completely full with people lined up down the highway to get in here, because this is about the future. And there are a lot of people that use a lot of catchy slogans about the future, but I'm gonna tell you, in my experience, the people who really care about education are the ones that are in the trenches trying to find out the facts. The facts about what's really going on in our schools. And I, when I go across the state and I speak to groups, I tell them, it's not enough for you to complain about your public schools. You need to know the name of the uh, trustee, the school board member who represents you on your local school board. You need to know the name of the school board president. You need to attend school board meetings because everybody talks about how we want to have local control. Local control only matters if you use it. It's not enough in our community to be drive-by critics. We should be trying to find out what is wrong in our own public schools or what is going right because we actually do have some examples of some things that are going on that are very right in certain public schools. I will tell you that the teachers I know, and I have some really good friends who are teachers and retired teachers, some of them in the audience today. I applaud them for what they do. I could not do what a teacher does. I don't have the patience uh, and that type of skill set to do what teachers do. And with the amount of administrative bureaucracy that teachers have to deal with, plus the cultural issues they have to deal with, it is, a, it is a very difficult job. And sometimes teachers feel like they are left alone because they don't believe that they have the kind of support from their administration and they don't have the kind of support that respects them as professionals and respects them to support them when they talk about discipline issues in their classrooms. So I'm so glad that you're here today. I hope that you will consider coming again to another Grassroots America meeting. We're one of the largest constitutional conservative organizations in the state of Texas. We meet every week and we are four years old. And we are still doing everything we can at the local, at the state, and at the federal level to hold elected officials accountable for what they do with our tax dollars and what they produce with it. So with that having been said, I want to introduce you very quickly to some people that I admire very, very much. And we have first, down here we're going, we will start in a few minutes after I introduce them, we have Reverend Kev Tatum. And I have watched many of his videos and read a lot of his writings and I will tell you, amen. Amen, Pastor. <laughs> Katrina Pearson, a very good friend of mine. Katrina is on, serves on the Tea Party Caucus Advisory Committee with me. Katrina Pearson is also on the board, a steering committee for the Dallas Tea Party and the Garland Tea Party. And I, I mean a real trooper. I enjoy working with Katrina very much. And you will also see her many times on Fox News. Uh, she's a, a regular on Cavuto. Then we've got Peggy Venable. Peggy is, has been for quite some time uh, the Executive Director for Americans for Prosperity of Texas, and Peggy does an outstanding job of getting the facts out about what's going on in our public schools. Then we have my good friend, Senator Dan Patrick. Senator Patrick is the Chairman of the Education Committee uh, for the Senate, and he is leading the way on education reform and doing a very good job. And it's a difficult job. And I think Dan will probably tell you why his job in the Senate and why getting a good legislation is difficult sometimes because of the rules of the Senate. He will tell you about that. Dan is also chairman of the Tea Party Caucus of the Texas Legislature. So now, if you have your cell phones on, please turn them on silent. And if you have to answer a call, please wait till you get outside before you start answering the call. Thank you so much and give them your good attention. Thank you again for being here.
afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for allowing me an opportunity to be here. I want to first, uh, after commending Ms. Flemings and all of those who organized the event, I want to apologize for my tardiness. Um, I'm from Tyler. <laughs> you should know how to get here. <laughs> All of my family lives here on my mother's side uh, and my father's side. Um, but I've never been this far into time. So this is a, a good experience, but please forgive me. Uh, so much is going on. Um, I'm just thankful to be here. We're at a critical junction um, in our state and our country. And I'm afraid that the rhetoric that we're hearing from our leadership is not very healthy when it comes to the educating of our children. Um, I'm very disappointed that many of the leaders in the state of Texas who look like me and tend to think like me on other issues, have completely abdicated their responsibilities to the constituency in which they serve, especially the children within our public schools. It took me about 15 years to figure it out. I'm a little slower. I'm a former football player, so you have to forgive me. My process slowed down quite a bit with those hits, but I still think for myself. But it took me a while to figure out what was preventing our leadership in our community who tells us that they are concerned about us. Why is it that they would embrace everything except for the very thing that could liberate our community? The longer I was frustrated with it, the more I analyzed it, the more I realized it had nothing to do about what was in the best interest of our children. It was always about what was best for their political future and survival. And those who unfortunately were, who were uh, investing and supporting them politically and professionally were not the ones who were looking out for the best interest of our children. Ten years ago, I was a more of a firebrand <laughs> in making that statement known. Um, before Senator Patrick made it to the Senate, we started publicly challenging black legislators in terms of why are you ignoring the plight of our children? And instead of them having a courageous conversation, um, they begin to retaliate and attack and demonize and criticize, marginalize and minimize our perspective in terms of why we need liberation within the black community through school choice. For the last nine years, I've been recovering. Uh, many of us, Glenn Lewis, uh, who was a former state rep out of Fort Worth, Ron Wilson out of Houston, Senator Ken, uh, Representative Ken Grusendorf in the House. Um, so many of us who were fighting for liberation and education were attacked, demonized, criticized, and oftentimes defeated with propaganda and subterfuge. And that was the last 10 years. And the good Lord sent us a champion uh, in the Senate who understood plight, who understood the challenges, but had the courage to take on this issue that has caused so many casualties in this area. He took on the issue and he's pushed it to the forefront. And that's none other than our friend, Senator Dan Patrick. And I'm thankful and so many of us are thankful that he's had the courage and this is a courageous move. The courage to push this issue to the front of the agenda 
in spite of the barrage of attacks on him personally and the Republican Party in general, and especially my friends in the Tea Party, who I, as a poor black Baptist preacher from inner city Fort Worth, also believes we're taxed too much already. <laughs> so we're allowing other folks to define who we are and what we stand for. And as a believer, I think it's time for the church, whether you're Baptist or Pentecostal, Catholic a Mormon or any other religion who understands the moral depravity that has consumed our public schools. And now we no longer have public schools in many of the schools in which I represent and look forward to giving those parents opportunities to get out. They're not schools anymore, they're cesspools. So I'm here with you today to reach out across any line that has been superficially put in front of us to move it out the way to sit down with all of you and embrace an idea that this country was built on freedom and that freedom comes with a price. And it comes with a price not for us who have already lived our lives in many ways. It comes for a price for those who are yet unborn. And friends, let me tell you, with the kind of money we're spending for public education, and the kind of results we're getting from public education, there will be no future for our children who are yet unborn unless we stand up, remove the lines, drop the drama, and support people like Dan Patrick and others, Senator Campbell, who have put their careers on the line in order to open up freedom again for our great state and for our children. So I'm here for you, I'm here with you, and I'm fighting with you, and I want you all to know, as Dr. King said to us, and we remember, that we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. And for some strange reason, I can never be who I ought to be until you are who you ought to be. The rich man can never be who he ought to be until the poor man is who he ought to be. And we can never be the kind of state we think we are until we look out for the least of those children who are trapped in a burning schoolhouse and they need your help. Thank you and God bless you. Well, thank you for your fight and being in the trenches. I'm honored to be among the people at this table and those of you out in the audience who have been fighting for the last few years to free children and citizens and everyone else that seems to be under attack today. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself, then I'll tell you why I'm involved. Um, you know, my mother was 15 when she gave birth to me. And by today's standards, I probably wouldn't have even been born. So I believe that everybody deserves that fighting chance. Even though I um, grew up in poverty, had some rough times, I've come to embrace all those hardships because it made me who I am today. And it's given me the opportunity to go back and identify those kids that I see a little bit of myself in and try to give them some of the hope and inspiration that I've achieved over my lifetime in making decisions moving forward, being where I was. So with regard to education in Texas, this is the last chance. If we are ever going to do anything about education in Texas, this is it. The demographics are changing drastically. Republicans will no longer be in charge of this state. It's a truth. Ideal and harsh truth, that's why they have me on Fox News all the time. Um, so we have to make decisions today on the kind of state that we're gonna be handing over to those who are coming out of these schools. 
The children in our school system today are going to be the leaders of our future in Texas. So what, what's really frustrating, and I'm glad we have some policy specialists over here, because there are a lot of myths out there that really make my blood boil. Whether it be from the homeschoolers or people in private schools who really don't understand the issues. If your children are homeschooled, that's great. If your children are in private school, that's fantastic. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about these children, these millions of children who are trapped, not even in a burning schoolhouse, but an entire system, an entire environment that is guaranteed to keep these children from learning anything, from doing anything productive. So the decision today that we're making in Texas isn't about rules and regulations on private schools, homeschoolers, and all that stuff, which just simply is not true. The decision today is, who are we going to leave in control of the people who will be running the state of Texas? It is that simple. This is about liberating children, yes. It's about educating children, yes. But more importantly, the future of our state is what's really at risk here. So we need to keep that in mind when we have this education debate. Um, the people who are, who are indoctrinating these children do not have your best interests in mind, do not have my best interests in mind, or even our kids who are private schooled or homeschooled. We have great people in our country that were wonderful innovators, millionaires, and billionaires now, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. They all came out of school before 1979. Who's out there now? Where are all these bright, brilliant Americans today? The Department of Education was established in 1979. That's a red flag, you guys. Something is desperately wrong with our country, and it starts in education. You could throw Mark Zuckerberg out there. He's the youngest billionaire in the country, but guess what? He went to private school. We have millions and millions of children today that we could free. We could free an entire generation of children if Senator Dan Patrick and those allies that he has in the Senate, and even in the House, which I was surprised, are successful. But unfortunately, we don't need the black Democrats to get this done. We don't need not one of them. It's Republicans that need to get this done. Republicans have always been the party of freedom, have always been the party of liberty, have always been the party for entrepreneurship, success, business, education. And it is Republicans that are holding up this process. The Reverend mentioned Martin Luther King I think Martin Luther King was too moderate. That's probably why I'm sitting here today, because I grew up listening to somebody called Malcolm X. And what Malcolm X said is you go get an education and you start your own business so you don't have to go and ask anybody else for a job. That's the message that I heard growing up. So I'm here today to tell you that I came from inner city, teenage mom, drug addict, suffered through all kinds of abuses and things that you can only imagine. But the difference between me and my siblings even, and those who grew up around me, which some of them are dead today, the difference was I was pulled out of that environment my freshman year in high school ended up in a little town called Forney, Texas. Graduating class of 300. Culture shock for me, but it saved my life. And I know that today. And that's why this is important to me because I know so many other kids who may have parents that seem like they don't care about them, that may have parents that are drug addicts on welfare, but I can promise you this, 
if those same parents that we've all given up on had the opportunity to put their children into a good school, they would do it hands down. Because they know that if they could give their kids an opportunity to not be like them, they would take it in a heartbeat. So really, it is up to Republicans in the state of Texas to decide what happens next in education. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Peggy Venable. I don't know, is my mic working? No. Don't think it, it is now, maybe. It took it just a minute to catch hold. I do have a slide presentation. First, let me say I'm just so honored to be on stage with these folks. I'm so honored I'm going to kind of step aside. As I show this slide presentation, hope you've picked up some of our material in the back, and I think we start our slide presentation with a brief video. If it works. Lauren's there in the back of the room and came with me, so we're trying to, we'll try to make this work. Otherwise, if it doesn't, we will just slip right through this slide presentation, and we also have another video. We'll let this go. Does it look like the audio is Okay, so audio's not picking up. We'll just go to that first slide. Why don't we do that? And I'm gonna step down here so I can see it too, because we modify this everywhere we go. But, um, you know, public education 30 years ago, that was me. I actually was the first White House liaison for the U.S. Department of Education under Ronald Reagan. And many of you might remember he came out with the iconic report, A Nation at Risk. And in that report, I'm not gonna read this, we basically found out, much to our shock and chagrin, that the U.S. was not leading other developed countries in education, that we were falling further and further behind all the time. Let's go to the next slide there. And, you know, here it is 30 years later and our nation is still at risk. You know, test scores are not improving, we're continuing to spend more and more money, but we're not really getting any better. Let's go on. And you know, what went wrong? We, it was not a lack of attention. We continued to focus on what's going on in our schools. That's the number one issue for most voters, certainly for legislators. It isn't a lack of funding. In Texas public schools alone, if you picked up this little infographic that we left in the back, it shows that Texas public schools over a 10 year period were funded at a rate of five times faster than student enrollment. That was 1999 to 2009. That is simply unsustainable, but pretty remarkable that we did it. Let's go to the next slide. Um, in Texas today, let's face it, we have about five million students. One tenth of the student population in the country is in Texas schools. We spend about $54 billion a year on K-12 education, and yet 315,000 students are going to failing Texas schools. And over 100,000 kids are on wait lists just to get into charter schools. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and I'm not gonna read all these, but the fact is, I am sick and tired of hearing the education lobby at the Capitol demanding three things. They're demanding more money, less accountability, and no competition. They want to maintain their monopoly status, get more money, and they want to be less accountable to you and me. And I think that's really disconcerting, and we need to keep that in mind, and that's what legislators are hearing every single day. They need to be hearing from you. Let me go to the next slide. Here's that chart again, how much uh, expenditures in Texas have risen relative to student population growth. How many of you heard in the media said that last session they cut education spending? How many of you heard that? I sure did from everywhere. The fact is the legislature put still more money into education. But the claim was that they did not fund growth. Folks, our schools are growing in the state. Yeah, we're growing, but only 2% a year. We cannot continue to fund it at five times that rate every single year. Let's go to the next slide. 
And yet, Texas school districts are in debt. We are $107 billion in debt, and I include principal plus interest. This is according to the official website, the Texas Bond Review Board. And I saw some signs as I was driving in. Joanne, I know you and I have talked about this. There is a uh, school district bond initiative before you now, I understand. Does anyone know just how much Tyler ISD is in debt right now? Tell you a little story. I had one of my own school board members call me and encourage me not to oppose a bond initiative coming up. And I said, you know, do you know how much debt there is after listening to her, all the needs of our kids? And she was really quiet for a moment. You could have heard crickets. And then she said, well, I'm ashamed to say I don't know. To which I meekly said, you should be ashamed. <laughs> and shame on you, but the fact is most of them on the board probably don't know. By the way, it is $1.2 billion. Billion with a B. We have a bigger school district than you do, um, uh, by almost twice. But you are $280 million in debt. You're over a quarter billion dollars in debt right now. Just for your information. People need to know that as they go to the polls. And there is a le some legislation that would um, encourage them to better promote or provide you with that information. So when the schools say that they need it for the kids, let us remember one thing. Every dollar of debt that we incur we are incurring on the backs of our kids and grandkids. We are leaving them a legacy for sure, but that legacy is a legacy of debt, not the legacy most of us want to be leaving them. Let's go to the next one. You know, it was amazing. I appreciate so much what, what Katrina said. Uh, you're so right, Katrina, Katrina, that on the ballot last May, how many of you, don't raise your hand, if you vote in the Republican primary, you were asked this question. Too bad Democrats weren't asked it. But you were asked the question, do you want that education dollars to follow the child to the school the parent chooses, public or private? And guess what? 84.3% of the Republican voters said yes. Now, some legislators will try to tell you, oh, well, they didn't mean private. They meant public. No, it very clearly said private there. They'll use all kinds of excuses. But I will share with you, by virtue of that, we also have a handout, which I hope you get. First school choice vote of this session. It is the House Appropriations vote last Thursday. When a, when a Democrat legislator came to the mic and offered Amendment Number 95, which said that they would agree not to fund any school choice programs. Now, it was poorly written, it was poorly conceived, it was a bad idea, and he was saying, vote to end any discussion about helping these kids. Vote to end any consideration of helping these kids. Well, folks, I want to make sure everybody knows how every one of those House members voted. So we have a chart at the back of the room or a list. Those who voted against school choice, and sadly, folks, 52 Republicans voted with 55 Democrats. Now that is shameful. They voted with the education lobby and against their own constituents in how they voted in the primary. By the way, it's also in the Republican Party platform. Let's go to the next slide. Now charter schools are a form of school choice and I will tell you, your next speaker has been a champion for school choice and for charter schools, public and private school choice. And Senate Bill 2 just passed the Senate and I heard many accolades for Senator uh, Dan Patrick, Chairman of the Senate Education Committee. And I sat in on every one of those hearings, as did many of us, and heard what a masterful job he did working with those folks who don't agree with us. But he was able to get that vote, that voted out, not just out of his committee, but out of the Senate. That is an incredible feat. Now we have to put the pressure on the House. Let's remember there are these education lobbyists that you and I are funding, and by education lobby, I mean all the educrats that are also there with their handout. They're really lobbying, in my opinion, for the kids. I mean, for the, for the adults in the system, not for the kids. And um, I appreciate everything that Dan Patrick is doing. He is a real hero to all of us. But in Texas, we have 460 charter schools, 110,000 kids in those schools. And let's remember, there are 101,000 kids on wait lists 
to get into charter schools in Texas. Let's go to the next slide. And charter school success, you know, it's amazing that two thirds of the studies conducted have shown that the charter schools perform just as well or better than traditional schools. And charter schools are generally in the very neediest neighborhoods. Some of these charter schools literally take dropouts. School, kids that didn't make it in public schools and that public schools really don't want. Hats off to them, they do some great work. I'm gonna do an event Monday night in Kingwood with the Charter School Association. Let's go to the next slide, I think we're about through here. And how can Texas improve? Well, we want to see Senate Bill 2 passed. It will increase access to charter schools in Texas. Now let me tell you, you may hear from some folks that they feel like they didn't get enough out of this bill. Let me assure you, the Charter School Association is happy that this bill doesn't eliminate the cap, but lifts it and lifts it in a manner that they can continue over the years to grow the charter school numbers more each year, and that is great news. Um, let's see, so uh, let's go on to the next slide there. I'm not gonna read about these opportunity scholarships. You know, um, the senator also has um, legislation that is for a, well, I'll let him talk about his legislation. I don't usually get to be on a forum with him, so. I usually talk about that. We're gonna let him talk about his legislation. We'll go on to the next one, but the key is for kids to have opportunities, whether it is a public education dollar that is following the child to the school, or whether the businesses have given a scholarship so those kids can have a chance. The key is to get them out of, out of uh, failing schools. And folks, let me just say this. I think part of the key is how many of us believe it is freedom when a kid is assigned by government to a public school based on their zip code. That is not freedom. How, how can we possibly accept that? Now, we're speaking in one area, it's Trinity ISD, where that school district is failing. And I said, you know, if, if government had told you that you must shop at grocery store XYZ, and you walk in and the produce is, is spoiled and the milk is, is rancid, you would be rioting in the streets. Why aren't you rioting in the streets? Folks, we have to get mad. We have to get busy. We have to support our legislators that are doing the right thing. Some of these bills are moving forward, some of them are sitting. We're very interested in the parent trigger now. We definitely want to see the schools being graded A through F. The charter school legislation is really Senate Bill 2 now. And an achievement school district really is a way for the failing schools to be, uh, to uh, get some new leadership and start to succeed. Let's go to the next slide. And, oh, let's see, if our sound works, we'll get to hear um, a, a brief video that we did with Reverend Tatum. Well, we can hear the music, but we can't. There's one track that didn't make it on there. You've already heard from Reverend Tatum, but look how nice he looks there in front of the cat. <laughs> As I tell you, we have a series of five videos. One of them is the mother of, of two children that are disabled and one that is gifted and talented and she is advocating for Senate Bill 115 that would give school choice to disabled kids. There are some great bills before the legislature. It's now, we're up to the wire. We have to push and get these bills forward. And the true leader in the Texas legislature leading this charge is the next speaker. I thank you and I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Dan Patrick, Chairman of Senate Education. Thank you. Baby. Can we go back to that last slide that showed the list of bills? Would you mind doing that? First of all, how many uh, educators do we have in the crowd? All right. Teach current. Te how many current teachers? All right. And former teachers. All right. Um, thank you for what you do. My, let me introduce my wife, Jan. She's sitting in the back row on the white blouse. She can stand up. She's a retired teacher. Kept me good company on the drive over and the drive back uh, later today. We were in uh, San Antonio last night uh, at an education awards banquet. And let me just uh, tell you that I'm, that I'm privileged. Um, we started the Tea Party Caucus last session. And I didn't know Joanne before that. I didn't know Katrina before that and many other people I've met. And we have real champions around the state who are working hard on their time, on their nickel, on their dollar to try to... Uh, keep Texas being the leader 
in America and in the world, do you realize that there is no other place in the world that has the freedom and the prosperity and the economy of Texas? Nowhere. I mean, if we fail in Texas, America fails. I mean, who are we going to count on? California? New York? Illinois? I mean, if you look at the big states, Florida is doing fairly well. But if you look at the big states, we're it. We are absolutely it. And in terms of politics on the Republican side, if we lose Texas, there will never be another Republican elected to the White House because the electoral votes of Texas and New York and California would, would add up to such a number that you could never overcome the math by any other combination of states. That's why Democrats have put a target on Texas. They have the White House forever if they take Texas. So what does that mean to me as a Republican, as a conservative? And I always tell folks, I'm a Christian first, conservative second, Republican third. And if the Republican Party ever loses its way from, from representing God and conservative principles, then I guess I'll become an independent. We have to stand strong. So Republicans have to get it right. And so Katrina was right, it's on our watch. We have the governor, the lieutenant governor, the Speaker of the House, the Comptroller, the Land Commissioner, the Agricultural Commissioner. We have 95 uh, to 45 or 55 members in the House, and we have 19 out of 31 senators that are Republican. There are no excuses. Now, we have some rules that Joanne mentioned early that, that sometimes make our job difficult in the Senate, but we proved this week in the Charter Bill that has not always been supported by Democrats, that it can be done. We passed the Charter Bill, even I was surprised, 30 to 1. And it actually was one Republican who was the no vote, and it was just a personal preference on his, on his uh, point of view, but 30 to 1. We got every Democrat to support the Charter Bill. And uh, Peggy's right, we didn't get everything we wanted, that's part of the negotiation process, but the two key parts of the bill or three parts of the bill, really, number one, we want to close down our bad charters. We have about 500 campuses in the state that are public charters, they're public schools, about 50 have been left over from the late 90s are failing. We need to close those down. There's no teeth in the law now to do so. This bill will give the commissioner teeth to close those down. And by closing down 50 bad ones, you open up 50 slots for great ones. And then our bill will increase the number of charters over six years by uh, over, or will increase it from 215 to 305, so 90 more. But here's the key. Once you're a successful charter, you are allowed to replicate without further approval. So if you have a charter school, and it's a, uh, what I call an A or B school, uh, exemplary or recognized, then you can continue to replicate. And that's really where about most of our growth has come because we're at the cap right now within a couple of schools. So if we can bring in 50 great charters from out of state or grow them in state, and each one is successful in the next couple of years, then they could multiply by five or 10 themselves. So that 50 turns into 500. Secondly, in our bill, we're allowing public schools to designate campuses as a, as a charter campus. We have over 1,000 school districts in the state of Texas. That would be a th if each district just designated one campus as a charter. Now, why would you do that? Because under the charter rules, you get a little bit more flexibility. You want to come to to school a little earlier, you want to stay a little bit later, you want to go on a Saturday class, you have some flexibility that traditional public schools don't have. That's why charters were designed, so that there's not one model that's fit all. So we could see, in the next six years, a thousand traditional public school district charters, plus several hundred uh, new charters from having quality charters come in. So that's really important. I want to give you some, and you saw some of the numbers from Peggy, I want to give you these numbers again to put in perspective how big we are in Texas and why this is so important. First, we have five million students in traditional public schools in Texas. Five million. That's more students in school than many countries have people. That's more students in school than the bottom 20 states in America have in total in school. We have to get it right. Now, what's the next group after five million? You always hear this talk from anyone who's opposed to choice. Well, you know, you're going to undermine the public school system. You're going to take money from public schools. You're going to destroy the public school system. Well, that's hogwash. Because you know what the next category is after five million? 300,000. Homeschool. The next category is 250,000. 
private school. And the next category uh, that we get down to are charter schools, 150,000. So five million in public schools, 300,000 homeschooled, 250,000 private, 150 in charters. We will always have 90 to 95% of our students in traditional public schools. That's why we have to get that right. And sometimes those who oppose choice will say, but, but, but Senator, why don't you just put billions more into our traditional schools and fix those schools in the neighborhoods that he courageously goes out and represents? Well, we've been doing that for years, as Peggy said, and we haven't turned a lot of those schools around. They're, they're famous dropout factories. Those five, we have 8,500 campuses, K through 12 in Texas, remember, big school system, 8,500 campuses, and 500 of those are failing. We call them failures. The state of Texas says this school is a failure, but yet you must send your child there. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? I'm forced to send my child to a school you tell me is a failure? And so we were having a debate the other day in the Senate about this issue, and I said, look, I'm all for turning those schools around. We have to turn those schools around, but it will take several years. And while we're turning it around, if we're successful, we haven't been in the past, because we haven't had the reforms to do so, if we do that, how about the kid who's there today? What's he supposed to do? Wait three, four, five years for that school to turn around? He'll already be out of school or he'll drop out of school. So it's kind of like if you had a problem with the plane, yeah, we've got to get back to the hangar, we've got to get it fixed, but we're flying it right now. So those passengers who are the students, we've got to help them right now. So when we look at this session coming up, and this I've been on education, this is my fourth session, and I was elected in 2006, uh, so my first session was in 2007. I represent West Harris County, a little bit of Houston, but basically anyone familiar with that area, Katy and Tomball and Spring in that area. And I was assigned education, so this is my fourth session on education. I've been vice chair the last two years. So I asked for this job, and my wife said to me, Jan said, why do you want to do that? Everyone's going to hate you at the end of the session. Everyone's going to be mad because you can't possibly make the teachers happy and the superintendents happy and the school board members happy, the unions happy, the PTA happy, the parents happy. You can't possibly win. She's probably right, and we do take a lot of arrows, but it's okay. Somebody's got to do the heavy lifting. Somebody has to do the job, and I'm old enough I'm old enough now that I don't have this long, I didn't get into politics until I was in my 50s, I don't have this political career out there in front of me. I'm not making decisions today, so I wonder how this will help me get elected to something higher later. If this is where God has placed me to do this job, if we get the job done and it would cost me an election, that's okay. We have to get the job done. And, and, and the pastor named off several people who have been leaders in school choice, Democrats and Republicans. Everyone he named lost their election because you have a target on your back and they come after you. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so, very quickly, because we want to open up to Q&A. So what are we doing? Can you go to that slide with, with our bills again? If you don't mind. We're going to pull up. We have a whole package of bills, and there's been a lot of talk about vouchers. Um, and we've, I've taken a lot of hits over that, and I've been quiet about it, haven't said anything about it. Um, not that it's misdirection, but if we passed our business tax credit uh, bill that we passed out of committee, we shocked people. You know, that as, as Peggy said, last week the House voted not to fund any public school choice. So everyone thought Dan will not move forward with his package of legislation. Why would he try to pass bills when the House has already said, we're not going to do it? Well, I have my job to do, they can do their job. So we passed our bill out five to nothing, um, one Democrat, four Republican for our business tax credit, Senate Bill 23. What does that do? That simply says if you're a small business, you can take a deduction from your franchise tax. The cap on it is $100 million, and those dollars would go to poor students in failing schools to give them a chance. Now, $100 million is a lot of money. But do you know what it represents of the school budget? 0.25%. We spend of state dollars, not counting your local property tax dollars, about 36 billion in our budget. 
So 100 million would help maybe 10,000 students. Remember, 5 million in public schools, we're trying to help 10,000. And, and somehow that's going to destroy public schools. So we passed it out. Now it's going to be very difficult because in the Senate we have this rule called the 21 vote rule. We have 31 members. You, have, you only need 16, a simple majority, to pass a bill. But if you all were senators, take 31 of you over here. If you all were senators, I need 21 of you to bring a bill to the floor. Well, guess what? There are only 19 Republicans. We don't always have them, you know, 100%. So I always have to get two Democrats. Every senator has to get two, every Republican has to do, get two Democrats on every bill. It makes it a little hard. Um, but we're making progress. Um, and that's how we got the charter bill out, 30 to 1. Now, all of these bills I've either, e either authored or I'm the joint author, because um, I have a couple, I, I can't handle the entire load myself, so I'll ask another senator to carry a bill. I've asked the Democrats to carry bills as well. And where are we moving? Well, first of all, the Achievement School District. What does that mean? An Achievement School District, we call it a dropout recovery district. If a school is a failure, then we can go in there with the commissioner and take that school over, turn it over to a charter or another public school district. So that's the Achievement School District. Very important. Up where, where the pastor is, most of our failures, those 500 campuses, are in El Paso, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston. In fact, it's one of the reasons, by the way, we have a tough time moving legislation, because inner city Democrats oppose it, for the most part, and, and superintendents of rural Texas who say, this doesn't impact us. Why, why do we want to do this? Well, and I'm in rural Texas now. And my answer to that is, it's for the future of the state of Texas. And it's the moral thing to do. Today, we, graduate, we have about 250,000 every year to graduate from high school. That's about the size of graduating class. Today, 20% drop out, and 20% graduate with what we call the minimum degree that doesn't qualify them for college or career. It's not much worth the paper trade known as a pastor. So that's 40% of every student old enough to graduate either doesn't graduate from high school or graduates not prepared for a gosh darn thing. And what happens when you don't have a high school diploma or you, you're not qualified to do anything? You're more likely to be on a social government program. You're more likely to go to jail. Nearly 80% of all people in prison can't read at the fourth grade reading level. You're more likely to be poor because 43% of all children born in poverty die in poverty because they don't have an education. Katrina told you her story. Difference maker. Someone gave her a scholarship to go to a school in another area, helped her escape. As we had such great testimony, the pastor brought great people down to testify last week in our committee. All minority parents from the inner city, heartbreaking stories. One pastor who has his own school said, these kids can learn, by the way, our charter schools prove it, these kids can, it's not about the kids not being able to learn, it's about being in an environment where they have the freedom to learn. It's about getting the parents involved, having the quality teachers. That's the name of the game. And I love one of our last witnesses that came down, I forget his name, but he said, you know, I'm almost offended that I'm here to testify because why do I have to come to Austin to get permission to send my child to the school that I want to send them to? Think about that. We already have school choice. If you're rich enough, you can send your child to any school you want to go to. And I don't, you don't have to be rich. I mean, mom and dad, a lot of people sacrifice. They're not rich. But they pay that tuition, send their child to private school. Or in the bigger cities, you just move to a better school district. You, just, you know, people don't sit on the freeway outside of Dallas and Houston and drive an hour in traffic because they like sitting in traffic. <laughs> it's because. That's what they sacrifice to do so their children can go to a better school, and sometimes it's further and further out. But if you're a poor single mom like Katrina was, whether you, whether you, whatever issues you may have, but even if you're standing up and flying right, and you're getting on the bus every day to take that job to wherever you're gonna support your children, you can't move to the suburbs, and you don't have money. So what does she do? So why does that woman, or that grandmother, or that guardian, not have the same opportunity as someone else, black, white, or brown, who can move to the suburb or send their child to private school. And what does it do? Again, five million kids in public school, there ought to be a few thousand in our private schools, 250,000. Let me tell you what it does. It creates competition. 
because the public school doesn't want that student to leave because when that student leaves, guess what? So does the money. In fact, I was going to pass a bill to show you how crazy this is, this session, that says no one in Texas is allowed to send their child to a private school. I don't care how rich you are, you can't do it. Of course, I wouldn't get one vote because people would say, wait a minute, you can't stop people from going that. Well, you're stopping people in the inner city from going it. And look at the drag it's going to be on the future of Texas. We cannot be a prosperous, strong economic engine to lead America if almost half of all students who are 18 today don't have an education. This isn't, this isn't time for evolution. This is time for revolution in our school. You know, Condoleezza Rice, Condoleezza Rice said at a conference I went to in DC, she did the first report on how our poor, our poor education is gonna impact our military. So how does that work? I'll tell you how it works, 75 percent of students who go to join the military can't pass the academic test. We, we hear all about this, we have the, all this technology, we don't need as many soldiers. Well, someone has to run the technology. I mean, this is a crisis, and all of you in this room, there are a few of you older than me, most of you younger, God's been good to us, we've had, we've had a great life, I'm going to get out of here all right, no complaints, I'm blessed, got two great children, a great grandson. My daughter's a nurse, my son's a judge. What more can I want? But I'm worried about my three-year-old grandson. What kind of Texas America is he gonna have? If half the people don't have an education. So, wrap up here. These are the bills and where they're moving. Graduating, this is really, grading schools ain't for us. This is really important. Florida did it, and it, gosh, it got parents involved. Right now, if I asked you what our grading system is in Texas, do you know? It's unacceptable, acceptable, exemplary, and recognized. What does unacceptable mean? Are you a D plus or a total fail? What does acceptable mean? Are you a C minus or almost recognized? You come home, your child or grandchild has a report card. You know they're, how they're doing. If you get a report card on your school and your school's an F, my school's an F, my kids don't do an F school? I thought it was just unacceptable. <coughs> Important. Charter schools we've talked about. Credit by exam is just an issue so that students can, can keep moving forward so that those who want to progress can continue to progress quickly. Home rule is, has, that's really turned into our campus charter so schools can, I was, I had a design to let entire districts be charters. That was probably too big of a leap. Um, so we're letting them just do campuses. Uh, intra, intra district, this is very important. This allows a student to go to any public school they want in any district. Any district. So why shouldn't you? You're paying taxes. You know, it's good. And, and I thought about it. I was up in West Texas talking to a bunch of superintendents. They were telling me they have 700 students who go to different schools. I'm thinking, that's a long drive. They said, yeah, the parents want to do it. Because in small districts, rural districts, they often don't have courses in every subject that kids want. They might not have pre-calculus, or they might not have a great teacher to teach it. So they drive. So we want to do that everywhere. Online education, that is the future. We have to watch it. I'm not going to talk about C-Scope today, but we're trying to tackle that bear. We passed a bill to put that under the control of the State Board of Education, because C-Scope is out of hand. Yeah. Really out of hand. In fact, I'd like to just close it down, but I don't have the votes yet, but I might before session's over, but we're going to put them under permanent. First time ever we've taken lesson plans, treated them as textbooks for the SBOE to be over. But online education is the future. Fewer textbooks, more online, online. Lens. And you know why it's important? Here's one reason why it's important. We, well, Jan and I were driving through some very small areas today. You know, only one out of every three math teachers in Texas has a math degree. Only one out of every three science teachers has a science degree. So you got a lot of people teaching out of discipline, and you want the best teachers. So if you're in a small rural area or an inner city area where they can't get the best teacher, why not have the best? It might, the best math teacher in Texas might be here in Tyler. Why not let that math teacher be online teaching that lesson? It just makes sense. And that's how kids learn. Parent trigger. 50% of parents plus one can take over a school if it's a failure for three years in a row. Parents come in, take it over. You're a failure for three years in a row. That'll create competition. Now, they can't take it over like run it. They turn it over to a charter or another public school district. And teacher effectiveness, just reevaluating teachers. Every one of these bills we have passed out of 
the Senate committee or off the Senate floor. Every one of people said, well, if you fail on vouchers, Dan, you fail. If I pass all of that, if we pass all of that, it'll be the biggest transformation of public schools we've had in decades. Plus, we pass more legislation to help special needs students foster children in schools. So with that, this is why it's important. Why is it important to you sitting here where you have a pretty good school district? Why is it important to you if your kids are good or your grandkids? Because the future of the world, the world is a, not a safe and stable place. Look what we're dealing with North Korea today. The world depends on America. They may not like us in France or other countries or be jealous of us, but when they dial 911 they get in trouble, who do they want? The U.S. Marines, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Air Force, the Army, the American taxpayer to bail their butt out. They must, the world must have a strong America. And America cannot be strong unless, who's strong? Texas. And Texas can't be strong unless we have the best education in America. With that, I'll close and we'll take questions. Hey, will you share a mic with, with Dan? Okay, now if you have some questions, please uh, start writing them down and give them uh, to Patty uh, as she takes up the cards. And the reason we're going to do this is because we want to get as many questions in as possible. Before I start with the questions, I want to thank um, a couple of, of our local media outlets for being here today. I want to say a, a special thanks to Emily from the Tyler Morning Telegraph. The Tyler Morning Telegraph thought this was important enough to cover. And one out of three TV stations covered today, and that is Region 56, NBC 56, KETK. When you see Neil Barton, you tell Neil, thank you. They believed it was important enough. Now I want to say one quick thing um, about our school district. Um, Grassroots America has teamed up with some of our friends in North Tyler. And we formed a coalition called No More Excuses, Tyler ISD. Because our district is not where it needs to be. And in fact, 19 out of 25 campuses, 19 have declining academic results. And I'll say one of the most heartbreaking things I've seen since I've lived in Tyler the last 20 years is that one of our North Tyler schools, and in Tyler, Texas, that's the minority schools. Jones Elementary was a blue ribbon school. Blue ribbon school for years. So we all came together in Tyler after some reforms and I supported building two rounds of new elementary schools. Some of that debt Peggy's been talking about. Because I believe the district was ready to do the right thing. So I turn around and I start today looking into what the academic results are in those new schools. And it's more than unacceptable. We just can't live with it. That's why we're opposing the bond election. Because we have too many children trapped in schools that are not educating them. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, I told the Tyler Chamber, some of their committees this last week, I asked them, I said, I invite you, if you have never looked at the TEA, Texas Education Agency website, and you've never looked at the comptroller's website to look at the results of these schools versus the dollars being spent per child. In some of the schools with the worst results are the schools that get the most funding. Folks, something is drastically wrong in a community that sits by and lets this happen and there is the sound of crickets from people who ought to know better. And I told that chamber group, I knew they were going to endorse the bond election. I knew it when I went there. But you know what? Somebody's got to stand up and say it's not acceptable. to see 
I'd like to see in House Bill 2980 and Senate Bill 1775, I'd like to see some of our North Tyler children set free to go to school at Jack Elementary. Yeah. And some of the South Tyler schools where they actually are teaching children, they have better academic standards. I'm gonna tell you, there's something wrong in our community when we are okay in our predominantly minority schools when they are sitting there as Jones Elementary used to be a blue ribbon school and now it's a one and a half star school out of five. It's not acceptable to me and I'm telling you, the people in this town that want to shun us because we're standing up, that is A-OK -okay with me. Because you know what? I can wake up tomorrow, Doc, and look at myself in the mirror and say, you know what, at least you tried. But we're going to stick with our friends over here, and I want to say thank you to Pastor Battles and to Mr. Cedric Granberry and to Mr. Granberry's father for being here, because these are men of courage. And I hope that they will meet uh, Katrina and Reverend Tatum today and share your life stories. So I'm going to quit preaching and ask the question. But she's good at it. Yeah, she's really good at it. I thought she was going to pass the plate. She will, too. You're really sure. It's at the door. Oh, okay. That's the middle. All right. First question. How do current charter schools replicate? Do they make additional campuses at the same level or expand? up, like expanding from elementary to middle school, a uh, center? Uh, the, the, the rules, are we good? The rules, uh, there we go. Oh. I might not have turned it on. Oh. I had it on. Excuse me. There we go. There we go. Nope. Nope. One, two, three, four, four five. There, there you go. go. Uh, the, the rule is, and I could be slightly off this, I'm doing it from memory, to replicate without approval from the commissioner again, because it's a long process. It takes about a year to a year and a half to be approved. So the application's like that thick. You have to be have finance, strong financial background as well as a plan academically. Uh, but if you're, if 75% of your schools are in the top two levels of our ratings uh, for three years, then we let you uh, increase. And if you don't have any school, it's unacceptable. So again, I may be off just a touch on that, but that's a, a little bit on that, but that's the general. So you really have to demonstrate that you've done a great job. And, and one thing I do want to just add to that, because again, we have some, what happened? See, the first charter schools in America came in the 90s. Texas, the first one was 95. And they, and they set the cap at 215 then, which it is today. We're raising it to 305. And unfortunately, the legislature granted over 100 charters in like a year. Nobody, they didn't, they didn't have the system set up. You know, it's like this star testing that we're working on that we're going to reduce way down uh, because we have too many tests. It just, it just, it was a bad model. And, we, and these are the failures. We've been stuck with them for 10 years or longer. So, so now it's a very, very high bar. But what I was going to say is we, we, we talked about, we focused on our failing schools. I, I do want to, we need to acknowledge that Many of our schools are great public schools, and most of our schools are doing a good job. And sometimes teachers or superintendents get upset. Well, you know, you're running down education. All of that, I'm not. I'm trying to lift up public education, but I'm trying to get them to acknowledge just because we criticize the weakest links doesn't mind, mean we're criticizing you if you're doing the job. You know, you have to, before you can solve a problem, you have to acknowledge you have one. You know, there are 330,000 teachers in Texas. You know, if just 10% of them aren't doing the job, that's 30,000. Need to go do something else. It's like legislators. Trust me, there are some that need to go do something else. There's always the bottom 10%. Thank you. What is the difference between regular public schools and the public school charter schools? I founded a charter in 2000, by 2004, through political subterfuge. I ended up not holding on to the charter in San Marcos. Back then when we started charters, the, 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 the benefit was the re regulations from the state were minimum. 
you are able to be as creative as possible. And there are still some creative opportunities. But the only difference I see is you don't have as many rules. You still have the same accountability system. You have to take the same test. You're actually having to do the same or more with less. And charter schools in many cases are performing um, at or better than many of our schools. KIPP Academy has done a tremendous job of replicating its program across the state and country. A lot of it has to do with your business model. And let, let me just say this, whether it's charters, vouchers, or whatever, the bottom line is money. We are saying give more people access to the educational dollar in an effort to produce better results and not continue to allow the monopoly of public education to dictate what is best for the Texans in our communities. That's the bottom line. If you listen to the anti-expansion uh, or anti-access group, um, the first thing out they'll tell you is it takes money away from public schools. The second thing they'll tell you, it, it hurts public schools. Well, guess what? If you're not performing, African Americans, black males, been one all my life. 83% of black males will be placed outside of the classroom for some kind of alleged disciplinary action. Two thirds are ill prepared for life outside of high school and there is no record of academic success in those core courses. Folks, this is not politics for us. Our babies are dying. For real. And for our leadership to play games with our babies is damnable. And we need courageous people, whether they're black or white or brown, rural or urban or suburban. And you can't forget the suburban fear. There's a suburban fear that if you give these kids hope and opportunity that they're going to infiltrate these private schools out in these beautiful hills of these piney hills of no guess what we personally the southern christian leadership conference we want to identify a thousand churches that are really willing to start a school and let them have access to the six or seventy five hundred dollars to start schools in their churches where we got started in the beginning when they wouldn't let us in public schools. We need, and, and our philosophy is, rear our own to succeed. We know what our kids need. We know what's happening. And guess what? Whether it's charter or public, most of the teachers and administrators in these schools do not live in our neighborhood. They take those same dollars and go out to the suburban or rural communities where the taxes are smaller. So, ladies and gentlemen, we feel your pain. We want you to feel our pain and not allow those who are controlling the monopoly to use subterfuge and division and even the term racism. You're beginning to hear that to keep some of you from coming over. Guess what? What they're doing is bigotry, or as Bush used to say, the soft bigotry of low expectations because they don't believe the babies can get better and they don't believe the parents know what's in their best interest. And my friend, where that comes, where I come from, that's called slavery. So that's the difference, whether it's charter, whether it's any of these bills that Senator um, Patrick has put up, yes, 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 and more yes. Don't get caught up in the details. Get caught up with increasing access and opportunity. And when you start taking those dollars away, Sister Joanne, I promise you they'll start changing their ways because guess what? They're starting to call their schools schools of choice. They're taking our language, but not taking our philosophies and our principles to be able to help all babies rise above the status quo. Thank you. Katrina, we talk about failing schools and declining results. 
Why are we not addressing these directly and replace the leadership in these districts? Nothing changes if nothing changes. Well, that's a really good question. I think in your opening, when you mentioned most people who want to talk about education or complain, rather, about education, don't even know who their school board member is, who their trustee member is. And so it's, we need education on all levels, including ourselves, who are engaged in this fight. Um, like the Reverend mentioned, some of the fears that are being put out there. We, as the individual, are not even educated on some of these topics. And if they're using our language, um, that tells you that we are sort of touching a nerve somewhere. Um, but with regards to you know, the, the superintendents, um, we don't get to pick them. Um, you have a school board, many people don't go to their school board meetings, but what's more interesting than that is Senator Patrick mentioned the number of school teachers. Um, Texas ISDs are the largest employer, third largest or fifth largest in the world. China, Walmart, Texas is right there. Their, their school districts are the largest employer, which is probably why so much money goes to them. So we have to start looking at it like a business, like an enterprise, and, and do hold these districts accountable. And the only way we can do that is to put these sorts of measures and, and grading systems in place. I mean, what is exemplary? What if I, what if exemplary, if I knew what that meant, wasn't good enough for my child? I should probably figure that out. So putting these forms in place is, is going to be the first step at taking control of the situation because the people of Texas have no control over the situation. Not just because they don't have control over their school boards, but because we have let our legislators sort of take the lead on the topic and not listen to their constituency. Let me give you an example. Something that's going on, let's just use Dallas for an example, Garland ISD pulled my son out. I sacrificed the last three years of his time at home, sent him off to his dad's out in Wiley, because I refused to let him go to any high school in the city of Garland. What they are doing to our children today is they've created a new revenue stream for the city. Your kid uses a curse word, you get a ticket. Along with that ticket comes a fine. You gotta take time out of your day, take your kid to court, seat the judge, get issued community service, pay a fine, and go about your way. Maybe even have to take a class, depending on how bad the word was. Take two days out of your schedule to go to this class with your kid for saying a bad word. And that costs money too, it's not a free class. So you have these underprivileged minority children trapped in an education system, which is now a new revenue stream for the city. But let me tell you, true story, two fifth grade students, basketball teammates, on the playground during recess, throwing acorns at each other. Does any of that strike you as odd or bad? Well, guess what? These kids got written up and cited for assault with a weapon. So they are already giving these children quote unquote criminal records before they even get into junior that's the school system we're talking about in the inner cities. That's what we're talking about is why we have to hold accountability and to, to Royce West credit, he actually addressed this in a bill, I think it's Senate Bill 408. He wants to hold school districts accountable because they're giving out these tickets like candy. And I think that's great. The problem is that they're giving these tickets out like candy to begin with. We shouldn't be making new laws to plug holes in the system. The whole system needs to be completely dismantled and rebuilt with the appropriate intentions for children in mind. So Joanne, the answer is we as parents, we as taxpayers need to get educated on how the school system works on the local level, take them over so that we can fight it on the state level. Thank you. So Peggy, exactly what is the difference between a charter school and a regular public school? 
I, I think the key difference is for parents, the fact that they get to choose that school. I think that's really the key. I think the whole debate that we're talking about is such an old system that we are using in public schools. Again, where else would we allow government to assign kids to schools based on their zip code, assigning them to government schools? I think it, just to say it sounds, it makes my skin crawl to think that that's what we're accustomed to doing, that's what we've always done, but we don't have to. There are so many other education opportunities, charter schools simply being a choice where parents can choose to send their children to that school if there's space. And right now, those charter schools are filled and we have 101,000 kids whose parents are waiting for them to get a chance for that choice. And that simply isn't acceptable. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, um, I tell you, Peggy, this may be one for you as well. I'm trying to combine some questions because the crowd wants to talk about C-scope, so I'm going I'm to get to them. Okay. Yes, yes. All right, um, but this one is uh, one more on charter schools. Uh, Peggy, could you address the concerns, well, first of all, who determines uh, which districts actually, who can get a charter school? Address that first. Well, that's been determined by the State Board of Education, but the new bill will make it the Commissioner of Education with the state, elected State Board of Education having veto authority. Am I right, Senator? Yeah. Yeah, currently, the system is the TEA does 90% of all of the work because the State Board of Education, you know, they don't even get reimbursed mileage when they go to meetings. Um, and uh, we have some great people on the State Board of Education. They meet about six times a year for three days. They're volunteer. They don't have they don't have staff. They don't have anything. So currently the role is the TEA uh, does all the work, sends over the applications to SBOE. The SBOE sets up some interviews and they make the final decision under the new accountability system to approve charters. Uh, first of all, we've never had training for the TEA or the SBOE, so we're going to have the National Association of Authorizers. There are best practices for approving charters nationally. Everyone's going to have to be trained. Number two, so we don't want some fat actors slipping through the nets. Look for things that are red flags. Number two, the TEA will continue to do exactly what they're doing now, but there'll be an interim step before the SBOE. The commissioner will approve or disapprove. Any schools that the commissioner approves, the final decision is with the State Board of Education, up or down. And uh, my former district director and campaign manager, a uh, lady named Donna Bohorich, who took uh, a lady, Terry Leo, who stepped down, she's the actual um, chairman of the subcommittee on charter, so she's brilliant and will do, do a great job. Before you go, I just want to say one thing about choice. I want you to think about something. A superintendent said to me, Dan, if I lose a student to a private school, it cost me money because when that student leaves, because they get funded based on the, we call it the average ADA, average daily attendance. And then we have something called WADA, which is the weighted average daily attendance. So a special needs student would receive more than a non-special needs student, for example. There are different weights and adjustments. And so they said, you know, if I lose a student, I lose my average daily attendance. I said, well, I have a question for you. Should we pass a law that no one can move out of the state of Texas? They looked at, and I said, because based on what you said, if little Johnny's father gets transferred to North Carolina, you just lost his money, didn't you? Well, yes. I said, so should we ban kids from moving? And that's how idiotic it is. And then, and he said, yeah, but this is a private school. So, well, let me ask you another question. If little Johnny's parents can afford to send him to private school or grandparents, is that okay? Well, yeah. I said, so. So it doesn't make any difference who's paying the bill. If I'm paying the bill for a poor child, does that change the dynamic? No, it's, the whole argument is just crazy, just crazy. Okay, uh, one more about uh, charter schools, and, and maybe Senator, you could address this then. Um, how many of the charter schools are the Turkish Gulen schools? And, and address uh, where we are in addressing the concerns about the, the people who uh, hold those charters, if they're American citizens or not. You know, there's a, there's a wonderful thing about technology. And by the way, if you're not on my Facebook page, please go to my Facebook page. Um, I think we have more than any other legislator because I do it all myself every day or almost every day. It's 
It's facebook.com, dan.patrick.texas. And I say that, or at Dan Patrick on Twitter, I say that because I'm a real technology guy. So I love the internet, and I learn lots of things, and I get a lot of information like C-Scope. I came from parents, grassroots, and teachers. But sometimes there are just things on the internet that are just not real, and you don't know the difference. And so I've seen all of the issues. First of all, I've seen emails go out, well, any new charter should have all these rules about the citizenship and the board. Of, it's already in the law. You know, gotta have this, Senator Patrick, or, or else I'm against the bill. It's already in the law, number one. Number two, um, I had a question about the Harvard School because I, you know, I, I read things and I listen to things. And it's all I can tell you is Harmony has now about 24,000 students at their schools. They get about 300 applications a day because they're noted for math and science. And, and I can, this is the only thing I know. I've not had one parent in my district, and now that I'm chairman of education, I get input from all over the state. People who didn't know me before now know me. I've not gotten one letter or one phone call from one parent of the 24,000 in the schools that's ever said their students are being indoctrinated into anything. I just, I mean, I just, it's just, I've never had a phone call, never had a letter, never had a complaint. What we do get are parents raving over the fact that it's the best math and science of their students or some of the best math and science. So if there are issues out there, like Cisco, it usually bubbles up from the grassroots. There's no, there's no way I know what's going on in a thousand school districts and 8,500 campuses. So uh, I just, that's my answer. And, and if they're like Cisco, I believe in tackling a problem head on. So we've tackled that problem. And, uh, and we're going to continue to tackle it. But I just haven't, no one's presented me with a problem except emails so far. There have been a lot of articles written and written questions, but nothing has bubbled up yet. But, but we are vigilant on that issue. Okay, uh, now we're going to get into Cisco. So you all trade off and chime in on answering these questions. Uh, what is the status of the investigation of Cisco, Senator Patrick? I'm sorry, I, I, want, I want the general question, sir. I guess it goes back to me. Uh, I first started learning about the problems with Cisco, and like, again, going back to the internet, I'm thinking, did they really have a lesson that said the Tea Party patriots were terrorists? Is that internet method really true? Well, I tracked it down. It was true. Did they really have a lesson that taught this much on Islam and that much on Christianity or Buddhism? Really true. Did they really have a lesson for sixth graders to design a flag for a new country that was a communist country so they had to design a communist flag? It was true. But more than that, I was concerned about how the structure was set up. I was concerned about a lack of transparency. I was concerned about a lack of openness. So I conducted, it was the first hearing we held. And the other members on the committee, I think, were thinking, okay, now we've got this Tea Party conservative term of education. Where are we going now? By the end of that hearing, let's just say, let's just say, not only were they convinced, but about three weeks ago, we passed the bill out nine to nothing, there were nine members on the committee, to quit C-Scope under SBOE because they were shocked. I mean, there were contracts that said, if you're a school teacher and you reveal anything to a parent, you could go to jail. And every time we brought up something to the, to the Cisco board, they'd said, well, we've taken that off the website. We've changed that. And let me tell you what Cisco is real quick. In rural district, we have, we have regional service centers in Texas. The state's been divided into 20 regions, and each region has a service center. Now, there are a lot of people who don't think we should have any. Some people support them. But in rural Texas, they tend to be more popular because what a regional service does is provide service to schools and school districts. So in smaller schools, and, and you have to remember, we have, again, it's all actually close to 1,100 school districts. 65% of all students go to only 97 school districts. The, the average school district in Texas is less than 2,000 students. I mean, they're very small. We have a lot of school districts that are under 500 students. So they're very small, and they don't have an IT department. So they have a computer issue, they need help. They don't have an HR department. They, you know, so they may not have a curriculum manager. So what C-Scope did was, uh, it comes out of the 20 regional service centers, and I forget what C-Scope stands for, I can't remember the acronym, but it doesn't stand for anything. <laughs> and it's not worth anything, so there we go. And, and so they started providing, they started out as, as a management tool for a new teacher, so that you knew where you should be in the third week of what you should be teaching in the fifth, so by the end of the year, you're where, you're, where the State Board of Education said you're supposed to be. That's okay, but then they, started opening up into these lesson plans. 
and they take lesson plans online, and they testify, no checks and balances, they have no idea what, we ask about the communist flight committee, we don't know about that lesson. Every year, it's always, you know, we don't know, we don't know. And so out of that hearing, I, I got them to agree to close down their private corporation. I got them to agree to put their lessons online. I got them to agree to a number of things. Well, I'm not so sure they've agreed because I got an email two nights ago, dated April 3rd, that the Decatur district, which is up in the Dallas area, is it not? The Decatur superintendent wanted to charge a parent $515 to get copies of the lesson plans. And in the email to the parent, the superintendent of Decatur said, I need to check with Cisco to see if I can give this to you. So they're already, in my view, and I've sent this out to other senators. They say they're complying, but I don't think they're complying. So I like, I just think they need to be out of the lesson plan business, period. And that's where I'm gonna keep pushing. But until then, we're gonna put them under control with SBOE. They have 1,600 lesson plans we have to review. Can you imagine, how many lesson plans do you think they have in social studies for kindergarten and first grade? How many could you possibly have? 82, just for kindergarten and first grade. And I don't know what's in them. So, so we're, we're, we're on that, we're on that issue. Let me just add a bit to Senator Patrick's comments. I had the privilege of serving on the Regional Service Center in Austin when we founded our charter school back in 2000. Um, I was asked to serve as the first charter school representative on uh, the Regional Service Center. And they didn't want charter school representatives on the board. And when they allowed us on the board, they did not want us to have a vote on the vote board. So I was just there. But I was glad I was there because it gave me an opportunity to see the inner workings of those regional service centers up close and in person. And I must say, uh, to my chagrins, we thought it run more like a for-profit enterprise that was simply focused on making a dollar than it was on doing what was in the best interest of those districts and those children to produce better outcomes. And we talked about this in 2003, 2004. So this is just um, an example of how they have used billions of dollars historically to use for their private enterprises. And when I brought this up to Senator Superior, Superior back then, they heard me, but the next thing I knew I was off the committee, off the board. So I didn't get to finish my third term. Oh, by the way, they had us um, have to be reappointed each year. So there was no continuity. And it's, it's a system, folks. It's all a system. This, when I first heard about Cisco, I said, it's the chicken, uh, what is it, the rooster coming home? Uh, the chickens coming home to roost? Yeah. They've been operating out of this way for years and years and years. And they go in when it's convenient and utilize the state system and then they come out when it's economically feasible for them to and not have to adhere to what Senator and some of the others have been questioning them on. So I appreciate this effort, but until we get a handle on those regional service centers, that mentality is going to continue to spin the districts out of control because many of them are refusing to move. We call them the educational mafia back in the day because some districts don't want to use their services at times but because of the pressure and how the system is set up, it forces them into uh, embracing things such as this curriculum uh, that many of us don't think is in the best interest. So that's my two cents. It's a mentality of well, the system. Thank you. I will give you a success story with Cisco here. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. As I said, I pulled my son out of. Garland Independent School District, put him in Wiley Independent School District. Then I found out that Garland didn't have Cisco, but Wiley did. So I went from one extreme into the other. Um, but I will tell you that the first thing we did, being who I am, we set up a meeting and brought in a, someone that had been going across the state speaking about Cisco and invited all the parents from Garland, Wiley, and the surrounding cities. And needless to say, that night a coalition of parents was formed. Uh, putting a lot of pressure on the Wiley School District, the superintendent had two parent meetings, gave us the whole presentation, how it began, and how they used C-Scope. So 
leaving this two hour meeting to you know a 30 second roundup is now what we've been able to do as parents is working with the school district. We can go up to the school anytime we want. We can log into the computer system and review every single lesson plan that our children are gonna see. He went a step further because there were a lot of parents concerned because of the truths that you speak of. So now on the Wiley Independent School District, they're gonna post the lesson plans that week online. So if you can't go up to the school and log into the computer and review your child's lesson plans, they'll do that. You can't access the tests, but you will be able to see what your child is learning. The good thing that Wiley has done with these contracts for teachers, they did not block their teachers from reviewing the content of the lessons. Their teachers were giving access in the summer so that they could actually look and see the lesson plans prior to school starting. Most cases you hear the horror stories about teachers getting the lesson plan that night and having to teach it the next day, which I agree is extremely ridiculous. The teachers in Wiley do not have that. They have freedom and access to the system. Parents now have freedom and access to the system. And they're also putting it on the website for parents to go and check out at any moment at any time. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you have every single superintendent call the Wiley superintendent, um, but I do think that that is a model that we can get behind until this mess is cleaned up. And when I first, uh, when I was named chair of education in the fall, I went around the state to meet as many superintendents as I could, because I really, I like to listen, that's how you learn. And much, much of what's in these bills, I mean the superintendents like a lot of our bills, teachers like a lot of our, not 100%, didn't expect them to, but like my wife said, you're not gonna make them all happy. That's not my goal, my goal is to focus on the kids, what's the best environment for the kids. But I had a lot of superintendents tell me, I'd ask about C-Scope and they'd say, Dan, I would never use it for a lesson plan, never. We just use it to keep our teachers on course on what they're to be teaching. But there are a lot of superintendents out there who testify. They never read the contracts. They don't know what's in the lesson plans. And, uh, and so some of the superintendents, like in Wiley, obviously are doing it right, and others are not doing it right. And they need to be held accountable. Can I ask, uh, yes. I'd just like to add a comment to that. I think many of us are also concerned that Cisco uses the Common Core curriculum model. And um, just, uh, just know, raise your hand, Lori. Lori, with On Point Broadcasting, is going to work with me and we are going to be live broadcasting a tweet fest on Tuesday at noon Texas time to talk about Common Core. I actually did a conference call with our activists in Pennsylvania because they're concerned about what's going on in Texas with C-Scope and how it relates to Common Core, which they are trying to fight in their state. You know, I do believe C-Scope is the most controversial issue in the state that most people under the pink dome at the Capitol know nothing about, and we are working to change that. So we do have an action item on our Americans for Prosperity Texas website, afptx.org. We have had more people take action on that C-scope action item than any other one of the, I think, nine action items that we have this legislative session. So it's an enormous issue, I really believe, that Senator Patrick has given the leadership that is needed call, to call the public attention to this issue. Back to the question we were initially asked, I think also that Attorney General Abbott is investigating C-Scope. I know some investigative reporters are doing the same. I anticipate we will be hearing a lot more about following the money and how C-Scope has been more about money for these region service centers and less and less about educating the kids. It is indoctrination. We have great concern about what's in the lesson plan, but we have also great concern about the lack of transparency and following that money. Peggy, I would expect then that after General Abbott finishes his investigation would be, that would be the juncture at which we could look for ways to um, either eliminate the regional service centers. In other words, we will have grounds to do so, or there will be political grounds to do so. I think we might just add, excuse me, that um, the region service centers are up for sunset. This is a regular process that the legislative um, uh, session, that the legislature takes to review agencies and um, public entities to see whether they're useful, are they running efficiently, are they working well, what are the recommendations then that might be given to the legislature that they might enact that next session. 
I will tell you, we will be fighting to eliminate the region service centers. They have betrayed the public trust. We will definitely eliminate them. I think there's a thing that the Texas region service centers do that the private sector can't provide. And big school districts, why should we have every single school district having to purchase lesson plans? That is an absolute waste of our money. And let's face it, C-Scope doesn't sell lesson plans, they rent them to you. You pay per year, per child, and no matter what you've changed or what you didn't like about it the year before, you buy that same substandard material that next year you rent it per pupil. So we'll be working to eliminate them. And the Texas Tribune did a study of all the C-Scope schools. They're in 875 schools, districts. And the, the school, overall, schools that use the C-Scope lesson plans, their students performed at a lower grade on the STAR test than school districts that didn't use. And yet we had, when we had testimony in our bill last week, I had superintendent after superintendent come up Rah, rah, we love C-Scope, rah. They brought all their customers in, it really aggravated them. Quite, in fact, one superintendent went back up and they gave a high five back there because he really challenged us, basically, to get out of his life. Well, I'm in his life, um, and, uh, and I'm not going away. Let's talk about the one that said that he vetted C-Scope. You, you shut him down. Yeah, because, yeah, he, he, he had to break the contract. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't know what was in anything. And I said, Are, aren't you concerned that the lesson plans teaching basic math and science are incorrect in your classroom. Well, everyone makes mistakes. Well, you mistakes. No, you're not supposed to make those kinds of mistakes. Lesson plans, if, you know, two and two out of nine doesn't work. Not that that was it, but, but and, and, the, and the last, so you know this, C-Scope is not under control of anyone. It's outside the State Board of Education. It's outside the legislature. It's outside the commissioner. The commissioner has authority over the regional service centers but not authority over their products and programs. Well, I just added an amendment to our sunset bill uh, on Thursday, or our big education bill. I added an amendment that will give the commissioner authority over the products and services so he can close them down. Now, I need to get that amendment passed, Tea Party supporters, and I need to get that amendment passed uh, in the Senate and get it done in the, in the House. And then the commissioner can Give him to pay attention, because he might close it down. Uh, Peggy, this one is for you. What is the best way to get people informed about C-Scope so that they can uh, inform their district? You know, uh, actually, Joanne and I were in a meeting. Did we talk about this? Yes. We were in a meeting last weekend. No secrets, really. The Tea Party leaders from across the state came together to talk about C-Scope, to recognize that C-Scope is one of the most important issues. Let's face it, what goes into our schools today is how our government is gonna to look tomorrow, right? And so um, the Tea Party leaders have agreed to take C-Scope on as an issue. I actually have a conference call, a strategy conference call with a number of C-Scope activists uh, Thursday, Wednesday evening, I think the 17th. And we are talking to folks both inside and outside academia. We are going to come up with an action plan with material. Right now, we all know all politics is local. We can't change Washington, D.C. and the debt load there, I tell people, if we can't change our local government debt load. So folks, all of this is local. And I salute Katrina and so many people across the state who have taken action with their own school boards. Some school boards and some superintendents are more, uh, are more easy, uh, easier to work with than others, are more malleable, more willing to, to listen. But the bottom line is we have to start taking control of our schools. Unless we start running good people for the school board, we are going to continue to lose control of our schools. So there are things that we can do. We're going to be providing better information, both on the transparency front, on the content front, as well as on following that money. But let me just share with you regarding the content. I have no confidence that the content that will be reviewed by the State Board of Education and the public reviewers this first cycle on social studies is going to be what has been 
in our students' classrooms. I believe that is being sanitized as we speak. Right. Right. And when parents come to me and show me lesson plans and say, I complained about this, and they changed it immediately, I said, and what makes you think they did not change it back the moment you walked out of their office? This can't be something that can be changed at the whim as if there is someone behind the curtain making these decisions and, uh, and we simply uh, can't step back and allow that to happen. We have to take control. I, I have absolutely no confidence in the region service centers. I will say that again. They betrayed our public trust and we must move forward uh, uh, eliminating them and taking control. Guys, I had to sit in and job the old girl's back is hurting. Okay, uh, Peggy, uh, probably maybe you, you've done so much work on this. If, if CSCOPE is not under anyone's official control, how did, it, how did Texas schools get it anyway? You know, here, I, I will first say, I'm no friend to most superintendents, and, um, and yet, I wear that banner proudly, that's probably true, thank you. But I do believe that many of them bought this product with confidence because they have had trust in the region service centers. I believe that's where the region service centers let us all down. Because so many, I've had, I've had school board members call me and say, Peggy, I just want you to know we have C-Scope in our district. We had no idea what we were purchasing. We had no idea what content was in there. And now we're stuck with it because that's the, the curriculum that we are using. Now, remind, remind you, at first, the Region Service Center said it's not curriculum because curriculum is supposed to be approved through the State Board of Education. And then, they, then you know, of course, Senate Bill 6 last session said that online material could circumvent the, uh, didn't have to be approved by the State Board of Education as our textbooks are because we use permanent school funds for those. And if you want to use the permanent school funds, you have to use an adopted textbook. Well, I think that was well-intentioned when it was passed, but it gave them this circumvention. However, they've been in our school, school since 2006. I'm sure they fought to get that circumvention, so they had a little more legitimacy. But, um, but I think the bottom line is that many superintendents probably didn't even know what they were buying. But now, they are too hard-headed to even admit that they made a mistake and to see some of them come before the committee and say to people like Chairman Patrick, I fully vetted it and I'm confident it's the best product for our schools. When the schools are not doing better under C-Scope, when so many errors had just been pointed out by SBOE Chairwoman Barbara Cargill, for someone to sit there was so ludicrous and, and so hypocritical to say, I fully vetted it. When clearly they either didn't fully vet it, vet it or they don't give a rat's ass what's in the kids' school. Okay, I don't know who wants to take this, um, but the question is, doesn't Project Share accomplish much of what Cisco claims to do, even if it's only meant for rural ISDs, and after all, it's free? Does anybody want to comment on Project Share? Uh, if I understand correctly, and I'm no expert on this, but I believe that the legislature provided an opportunity for small school districts to band together to share resources, whether it be purchasing, administrative, other resources, such that they don't each have to duplicate the same thing in their school districts. I think it is in place. Uh, frankly, let's face it, I think uh, we have so many school districts, it makes sense that they should be consolidating some of those services, but maybe we have too many school districts. Horrors for me to say that. I am a, a graduate of Odessa Permian, Friday Night Lights, Mojo Mighty Panthers. We love our football. We here in Texas love our football, but folks, there's a way to preserve our football, but still make sure that kids get a quality education and that we don't have to have one non-teacher for every teacher in our schools today. That we don't have to continue to spend 50 cents out of each education dollar on something other than instruction, the major purpose of our schools. 
So um, whether it's Project Share or any other, I think that there should be an opportunity, perhaps a renewed effort. And let me tell you, I don't think this is gonna happen unless there is school choice, unless school districts are forced to change their ways. Right now they are fat and happy. They are demanding more money and getting it. And they have absolutely no incentive to be more efficient, and we need to force that. Should we maybe one more, have any more questions? I, I just don't want to keep people too long. So. No, no, we've got we've got probably another 15 okay. minutes. Um, is the Texas Association of School Administrators, or TASA, part of the regional service centers that promote CSCO? Oh, I'll take that one. <laughs> Only because the Texas Association of School Boards and the Texas Association of School Administrators have absolutely waged war against me because I've waged war against them. Folks, these are folks who take our tax dollars from our school districts and then what do they do? They fight what parents want in our schools. So um, the Texas Association of School Administrators has nothing to do with education region service centers though they may very well be promoting some of that material. I will tell you that I just got a PowerPoint presentation that one of the C-Scope school district superintendents had given at the spring TASA uh, conference. And in that presentation, she said that they needed to be more proactive in voter registration, among other things. Now, folks, if that doesn't send a chill up your spine and make you angry, I don't know what should. Because they have absolutely no business in voter registration or in anything to do with elections. So, um, and again, we're going to be releasing this. I forget the name of the school district, or I would tell you. I want to say it was one of the superintendents that has a presentation out slamming all of us who are opposing C-Scope. And right now, C-Scope and the Region Service Centers are sending material around to the C-Scope school districts how to defend C-Scope, how to deal with parents and the public who, um, who come in to oppose C-Scope. They have an enormous PR campaign. Their website's changed. Their material on their website has changed. They are ready for battle, but folks, we are too. Question about the access to C scope. So, Senator Patrick, in your mind, where are we on parents and people that are not on uh, school district payrolls? What access is it your understanding that we should have today? Well, according to the agreement that I uh, got them to sign back in February, uh, they were to put all of the lesson plans online. Uh, they needed, they said, some time because the lesson plans have the test answers embedded in the lesson plan, which I understand that makes sense. If, you're, if you want a child to pass the test, then you have to teach them at some point the answer to the question so that they can pass. So they had to take the answers out um, of the test. Uh, they told me that had been done. And so, again, they had 1,600 lesson plans, and now they're downloading these lessons online. And they did a big press announcement this week that they had them all online. However, I'm now getting feedback from parents that say, no, they just have samples online. And further, this Decatur superintendent said, well, he had to check with C-Scope to see if he could make it available. And this is why I think we need to shut down the program. I don't, I think, I think they have um, been less than, uh, it's been a lack of candor uh, in terms of what they've agreed to do and following up. They're totally, totally mismanaged. They have no management structure whatsoever. Uh, it, it, it was an embarrassment their first day that they testified. Just an embarrassment. They didn't have a clue what they were doing. You know, I, I, I mean, not a clue. The first question I asked was they formed this private corporation. And that's what they were hiding behind. Every time a parent asked for something, they would, and, and the parents were sending open, let it, open records requests and Cisco, and it went to the Attorney General. And C-Scope's answer was always, well, we have this private nonprofit that we set up. And so therefore, we act like any other company, but we, for proprietary reasons, we need to keep our lessons protected. Well, wait a minute. 
publishers publish textbooks. They're private companies. That's right, you can see. So why are these why are these secret? So the first question I ask them because you can't be a public entity and form a private corporation with tax documents unless we give permission. There are exceptions. For example, um, the general land office wanted permission to form a nonprofit, the Alamo, to help raise funds. So the legislature approved that, but they couldn't do it on their own. So my first question to them was, who gave you permission to form this private company? Uh, no one. Did you ask your legislator? No. Did you ask the attorney general? No. Who told you, you could do it? Well, our attorney. Do you have a written opinion on that? No. So they're closing that down. And I said, so, and, and I held up the letter that they sent to the Attorney General. I said, it says in this letter right here, I remember it like it was yesterday, it says in this letter, you operate like any other private company in Texas. It says, is that what, is that what you all said? Yes, that's what we said. I said, well, tell, let me ask you a question. Do you all have an address for your private company? No. Do you have a phone number? No. Do you have any employees? No. Do you have a bank account? No. Does any money flow through or out of this nonprofit? No. I said, I don't know of any private company. You talk about every private company operates like this. It doesn't have an address, a phone number, an employee, or a bank account. That's a shell corporation meant to hide what you're doing. And that's why they ought to be closed down. I just can't get enough people to agree with me in the legislature yet, but I'm not giving up. So we're doing the best we can now because we sent all these lessons to the SBRE. The SBRE, I believe, is going to find so many mistakes that eventually legislators who are protecting them you know, will eventually cry uncle and say, okay, Dan, I got it. Yeah, we need to close them down. We, we need to close this down, besides the amendment for the commission. It's just a mess. It's, it's, it's a mess. Okay, if C-Scope is rented every year, why can't the districts just stop renting it? They can. They absolutely can. But just as Senator Patrick said, some of these superintendents will even sit before the legislative committee after hearing person after person testify on biases and errors and omissions in this material, and they will sit there and defend it. It is absolutely indefensible. And frankly, a lot of those superintendents ought to be given that pink slip and a boot out the door just by virtue of it. an annual fee. These school districts pay monthly fees. These are monthly services. This is access monthly. So let's just say they said, okay, we're not going to pay it anymore. Well, then guess what? You've lost your lesson plans for the remainder of the year. So that's why this is sort of a work in progress, because in order to maintain access to the internet-based program, you have to pay the fee. So until this situation can get worked out, whether the legislature can do something about it quickly, um, maybe something that can be developed over the summer so that school districts have something to put in place for the, the next year because that's essentially the problem. These less, you lose access to the lesson plans and your teachers have not spent all summer working on lesson plans. They're now codependent on the system to function for the remainder of the year. But these are only some of the school districts in Texas. The big school districts have curriculums. Curriculums are out there. There is not, it's not like there is no alternative to Cisco. They are everywhere. Why are we as taxpayers paying for it time and time and time again? Why can't smaller school districts use the curriculum that has been developed by some of the larger school districts? We all pay for it. Test. Again, it goes back to the notion that they're operating a governmental enterprise as if it's a for-profit enterprise, and they're not looking for what's in the best interest of the state or the people. They're looking for what's in the best interest of them making money, because otherwise, they would not, I'm getting some feedback. Otherwise, we would understand now with the internet, the ability to put material out there for free, that you could get textbooks online on a DVD or disc. You can get all of these things online free of charge. Uh, we've already paid for them once. They're just coming back and paying for them and making money off of them again. 
without looking at what's in the best interest of the kids. Imagine when they set up this quote unquote enterprise, they knew exactly what they were doing and it's not the first time. When I sat on the board, that's exactly why I knew that they were working outside of the best interest of the kids in Texas. They were working on what was in the best interest of their economic power. Now, ma'am and sir, please, I'm not talking about an individual. I'm talking about a system that continues to fail us all. When you talk about individuals, they take it personal and they think you're talking, you know, in, in the larger scheme of things. So let's not talk about individuals because same mess, different address. Almost 1,200 public schools, you'll see it happening all over. When there's free money that you feel you're entitled to, you're gonna do what you think is in your best interest. But when you start holding them accountable and talk about better results, then all of a sudden they demonize the Peggy's of the world. That's all she's asked. If we're gonna spend $36 billion every two years on educating five million kids, we at least ought to get 55, 60% better results. At least. But when you have 650,000 African American students and two thirds of them are ill prepared after high school, guess what? That's $120,000 per kid with no accountability and no one asking for better results. And instead of looking to see why we are producing the worst results in the history of our country, even doing slavery and Jim Crow, they want to call you racist and they want to call us people that don't care about our own communities. Well, my friend, I'm like Peggy, forgive me, I'm Baptist, but to hell with them all, because that's exactly where they're going if they continue to let our babies die on the vine. And I, we need you, every one of you, we need you. But one of our biggest challenges, and I can share this, is we're not organized well enough around the issue of educational freedom. We're not funded well enough around the issue of educational freedom. Sister Peggy and some others have been in this a lot longer than me. I came in in 93, 92, 93. They've been fighting this battle a long time. And I had to put the intellectual thought process on this to understand why is it that there's so much resistance from the very people who say they represent me. I'm talking black legislatures. Why are they fighting this so much when those of us who are pastors and are in communities, who have to go to school meetings with parents, who kids are getting kicked out of school for a little bit of nothing, who have been sent to juvenile justice centers for a little bit of nothing, and then their parents are being forced to pay goop gob sums to try to get their kids either out of the criminal justice system or in another school that's gonna give them an opportunity. To hell with them, because we're losing babies while they're talking about making money. And when we took a bus, two buses from Fort Worth, another van from San Antonio, and there was one supposed to be out of Tyler. But guess what happened to the bus out of Tyler? One of our good friends in Austin called the president of Jarvis Christian College and counseled the students from Jarvis coming down to let you know they get public funds for college. Why can't our babies in K-12 get it? Y'all, and I'm gonna close with this. The reason I wanted to come to Tyler was in 1965 at the beginning of the year, the man who impregnated my father told her to have an abortion. She refused to have an abortion and she took her babies. We were poor, took all of us and went west to Fort Worth, found an abandoned house. We lived in an abandoned house my first, before when my mom was pregnant with me. I was born premature with jaundice and the doctor gave up on me on day one. After six days in an incubator, they finally took me to my mom on Christmas day. I lived in poverty my whole life. The way I got out is I had big hands and could catch a football and I ran pretty fast. But when I recognized that I got out and the other nine were left back. God said to me, it's your responsibility to go back and open up access for them. Whether it's in Tyler, Fort Worth, Dallas, or Odessa Permian, our kids 
are producing the worst outcomes of any children in public schools. The state of Texas has come to the conclusion that when everything is in common, the number one factor that is causing the worst outcomes are the institutional racism within public schools. Folks, we need out. Not tomorrow, not in the future. People like my mom, who they said because she was poor, we lived in housing projects and everything, we didn't deserve the same opportunities. Walk by private schools who were doing a great job with a bunch of kids, could only marvel at the idea of going to a private school. But headed to an elementary school where the teacher says, you're nothing, you're never gonna be nothing because of your place of zip code and where you come from. Folks, this is real. This is really real. And we need more feet and we need more finance. Because this past week in Senator, uh, Senator Patrick's uh, hearing, we brought all of these superheroes, the mothers and fathers, some on canes. The oldest man was 92 years old. He said, I voted Democrat my whole life, but if they don't vote for school choice, I'll never vote for them again. This is real. We need your help. Don't allow the naysayers or the doubters to cause you to pause. We need you to be supportive of Peggy. We need you to be supportive of Senator Patrick. We need you to be supportive if the Tea Party is pushing this issue, then support the Tea Party. We have some ministers for education and we're hoping to get more ministers because they understand it up close and personal. And you know what they're looking for? Options, access to their same money that's going outside. So thank you all. Tanya and I, we drove down, we're gonna drive back, gotta preach in the morning on this stuff. Um, but I want you to know, it's places like this who have the courage in the midst of the battle to come together and talk this out that, are really, that is really gonna make the difference. So thank you all, Grassroots America, and everyone else, uh, Americans for Prosperity. Thank y'all very much for allowing us to come, but we can't do it without you. We need you. Black, red, yellow, black or white, they're all precious in God's sight. Thank you. There are two websites. We do have it on our AFP Texas website. We have a new post on C-Scope and we have a link to it, but it is directly linked on a website called Texas C-Scope Review. It will be on the right-hand side of that page near the top. It is Texas C-Scope Review and they have a list of every school district that is currently using C-Scope. Look this way. Look this way? <laughs> Thank you. And remember, um, if, you go to fa if you're a Facebook person, it's dan.patrick.texas. And on uh, Twitter, if you're a Twitter person, at Dan Patrick. Very easy. And it's been a real uh, privilege for me to come here. I appreciate joining you setting this up. She's been wanting me to come for quite a while. And our schedule is busy. We don't really do, uh, I don't take too many uh, speaking engagements during session because we're, in fact, my staff is working at the Capitol today because we have our testing bill up on STAR Test and Curriculum Tuesday. So that's a major piece of legislation we're working on. And so Jan and I will be heading back uh, immediately as well. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for caring enough. That's the bottom line. You know, you just have to get people to, to care and realize what the issues are. And uh, people are busy. And remember, it only takes a small amount of people. You know, the old 80-20 rule is the same in life and everything you do is, you know, most people are gonna drive by up and down the freeway and not pay attention. That's why your power, your power is multiplied by so many because most people are gonna step back and let you do the work. So your amount of work and your amount of energy and your amount of intellect on any given issue is game-changing, game-changing. Um, so we can't, we can't have any success without you. 
And so I appreciate it, and uh, thank you again. And uh, in fact, you all are coming into Austin tomorrow. We have a team, so they're driving into Austin tomorrow. They'll be uh, following us up there right tomorrow. Uh, actually, we're going to have them tonight. Hey, you want to say? Um, I might simply say one thing. If anyone <coughs> questions Senator Patrick's passion for this and where his heart is, all you need to do is see him in any of his committee meetings. But this last week, uh, Kiev and I got to see him when one woman sat there and discussed how her disabled child needed a piece of equipment that the school had, but she couldn't check out, she couldn't take over the summer, that he lost, uh, lost some of his, uh, uh, some of the things he had learned over the, over the school year during the summer, and he literally offered to buy her that piece of equipment. And I, I guess your wife heard about this later. But, um, I do she be in. <laughs> but the fact is, it was so touching to see that he truly cares about these kids. And I, I believe that so many of the education community do, but so many of those we see at the legislature are really there for the adults and not for the kids. It is so important that you weigh in. Thank you for inviting us and letting us be a part of this. And I just want to say thanks to Grassroots America for always hosting very good, informative events and that you all have an interest in this. Many of you can't go to Austin, so just a reminder that you can watch these hearings on Texas Legislature Online. You can go back and watch previous hearings if you want to get caught up on a particular issue of your um, interest. Um, you can follow me at Katrina Pearson, Pearson with an I. And um, that's another way to keep up to date if you're in front of a computer just to follow the feed on Twitter. Um, it, it gets pretty intense on there sometimes. So um, I highly encourage you to follow it because there are things that are going on that we probably can't remember right this second to tell you. Um, but if you can follow it, we highly encourage it. And thank you all so much for having us again. We appreciate it.